John chapter 10, I wanted to read this quickly. If you remember, we're looking at the church office of a, uh, a uh, bishop is what it says in our text in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, we saw that to be the same as an elder. We saw that to be the same as a pastor. And we saw that pastor is the same word, shepherd, right? That's, that is what it means. That's where it's, how it's translated everywhere else except for the one place in the New Testament that it is uh, translated pastor. It, you find the exact same pattern in the Old Testament where you run into the word pastor. Um, uh, Jeremiah, I don't remember if I wrote down that passage or not. I thought I did. Uh, Jeremiah 23 verses 1 and 2, you'll find that word and it is in, again the same word shepherd. Um, so what we're looking at is we're considering shepherds to understand what the role of the pastor is. And uh, I, I just want us to read this again because if you remember when we started this study, we said to, to study the office of the pastor is to study the character and the person of Jesus Christ. And we see here, Christ is the pattern. When we talk about shepherds, who is the pattern for the shepherds? The good shepherd is the pattern for the shepherds. And so we have that uh, terminology here in John chapter 10. In verse number 11, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd, what does he do? He gives his life for the sheep. That's the, that's the pattern, right? That's the example set by the Lord Jesus for the pastors, for the shepherds of God's uh, church. And if you skip down to verse number 14, he says again, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. He says that again. And so we see that the life of the shepherd is the sheep, right? I lay down my life for the sheep. Christ says that twice. The life of the shepherd is the sheep. They are the focus of his constant service. So uh, to understand what the pastor is to be in his service to the flock, who do we have to look at? We look at Jesus Christ. We look at the good shepherd that laid down his life for the sheep. After all, we say it in Psalm 23, the Lord is my what? Shepherd. shepherd, right? So he is the good shepherd and the pastors of the churches are under shepherds. Uh, they are under him, looking to him for that example in their responsibilities to the flock of God. Uh, so I want to continue today in our study. We'll go to Ezekiel 34. If you remember, we were over there. Looking at, um, looking at what pastors were not, what shepherds were not as God rebukes the pastors, the shepherds here. And so by looking at what they were not, we're going to understand what they're supposed to be, right? Uh, here the shepherds had failed. Uh, in Ezekiel 34, the word of the Lord came unto me saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds. Woe be to the shepherds of Israel. So they had failed in their responsibility. How had they failed? Well, instead of being servants to the sheep, they had viewed the sheep as their servants. Uh, instead of laying down their life, for the sheep, they were looking for the sheep to lay down their lives for them. And it says, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. What was the first thing that we saw last week regarding the primary responsibility of the shepherd? It is to feed the sheep. Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Right? The primary responsibility is to feed the sheep. And we saw that the way that is accomplished is by faithfully declaring the Word of God. Uh, we're going to see today that takes place not only in the pulpit, but it takes place on a one-on-one -on -one basis. It takes place among the flock of Jesus Christ that the shepherd is responsible for. And so they had failed. They were focused on feeding themselves. And the Lord asked this question, should not the shepherds feed the flocks? How ridiculous to think that a shepherd, I mean a true shepherd, would preside over a flock and not feed the flock. His primary responsibility is to guide them to that good pastor so that they will thrive, right? Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? And so what were they doing? You eat the fat and you clothe you with the wool. You kill them that are fed, but ye feed not 
the flock. Look at, uh, I, I, hold your place here, and I just want to read something because I said last night that, uh, that this, these, these shepherds here, I think this would not have been a problem if they were merely clothing themselves with the wool, and I'll show you why. 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. In 1 Corinthians 9 and in verse number 9, the Apostle Paul writes to Corinth, For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the, ox, uh, the, the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. And so he asks this question, Does God take care for oxen? Is that why the Lord said this? He wants to make sure you treat your oxen properly? That's not the focus of uh, this instruction. Or saith he it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt. Peter needs to read that, right? People for the ethical treatment of animals. I want you to understand that God values a human life more than he does an animal life. All right? Why did he talk about oxen here? Was it simply to teach us about how to care for oxen? No, this was for our sakes, the Apostle Paul said. Uh, uh, I understand that even the right, that a righteous man even cares for his animals, the Scriptures tells us, and the tender mercies of the ungodly are cruel. But that's not the focus here. For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth should plow how? In hope, right? And that he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. What's the Apostle Paul saying? He's saying if I plow the field, if I plant the field, I ought to receive of the increase of the field, right? What farmer is with, you know, are his crops withheld from? If we have sown unto you spiritual things, Paul asked the question, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? Is that a great thing for us to benefit and to be uh, supplied for by the church when we have labored diligently in these spiritual things? No. So uh, it, the, the clothing of the wool here, I don't see that as the big issue. What I see is the issue here is that these shepherds were acting more like wolves who devour the flock than shepherds that guide and feed the flock. Right? Wolves devour the flock when their primary responsibility was instead to feed the flock. And so that was our first point last week. The shepherd is crying out continually to God for that word that the sheep need to be sustained. So what is our second point this morning? And we'll, uh, uh, let's see, we read, did we read verse 3? We did, didn't we? Yeah, you clothe thee with wool, you kill them that are fed, but ye feed not the flock. And so what is the next accusation against the shepherd? And this takes us to our second point. The shepherd's responsibility is to tend to infirmity in the flock. Listen to verse number four, the beginning of it. The diseased have you not strengthened. So what then should they have done for the diseased? They should have strengthened them, right? Uh, neither have you healed that which was sick. What should they have done for the sick? They should have healed the sick. Neither have you bound up that which was broken. They should have bound up the broken. And we're going to stop there and we're going to we'll look at the next part of this as our third point. So they, sh they needed to tend to the infirmity in the flock. That is part of the shepherd's responsibility. The shepherd's desire is the well-being of the sheep. The shepherd's desire is the well-being of the sheep. He seeks to mend where infirm. Uh, I quoted something this morning uh, as we were talking about my personal failures, my personal weaknesses in the prayer list this morning, um, in, in uh, chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians, uh, as the Lord is talking about the flock, as God has t is talking about the church, in verse number uh, 26, He says, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not... Many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen, what's the next three words? The weak things, the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. He goes on to describe the church as being predominantly, predominantly the base things of the world. And the things that are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught 
things that are. And why does he do it this way? That no flesh should glory in his presence. Here's the thing. If a shepherd's not tending to infirmity in the flock, most of his ministry's gone, right? Because what are we dealing with here? We're dealing with the base. We're dealing with the foolish. We're dealing with the weak things. That word weak, that phrase, the weak things right there, 12 times it's translated weak. Six times it's translated sick. Strong's defines it as without strength, as being infirm. And so the shepherd's ministry is primarily to those that are infirm. Primarily to those, and I say primarily because it says not many. There are some wise, a few, right? But most of us fall in that base and foolish and, and uh, weak things, right? So the shepherd's got to primarily be able to minister to these that have infirmity. And the reality is that we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God, right? We all possess infirmity. So this has application for us in the natural. Look at James chapter 5. James chapter 5. Here the elders are specifically called out concerning those that are physically sick. Verse number 14. Is any sick among you? Then let him call for who? The elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of the faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. There is literal application in, uh, in the elders function regarding those that are literally sick among the church. And he is not put out by such responsibility. The sick call for him. The uh, good shepherd is there, right? And what about spiritually? Even more so, we find that application in the spiritual sense. Look at Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. In Hebrews chapter 13 and in verse number 7, Remember them which have the rule of over you. They, they are overseers. They are bishops. That was one of our words used to describe the elders and the shepherds who have spoken unto you the word of God. Just to make sure that we're clear on who we're talking about. We're talking about those that rule in declaring the word of God to you, right? We're talking about the elders, the bishops, and the pastors among you whose faith follow considering the end of their conversation. Um, I think I wanted verse 17 actually. Yes, verse 17 is the one that I wanted, but that verse 7 there sets the stage for that because it, it shows us the context of who we're talking about when we read verse 17. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. I told you guys, the pastors, we're under the uh, microscope right now, but your time's coming, church. Here's a little taste. <laughs> Here's a little foretaste of that which is to come. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves because what are these men doing? They're watching for your souls, right? They have your soul's best interest at heart. The faithful shepherds are concerned about your souls above all, and they understand they are the ones that must give account for those souls. And they desire to do it with joy and not with grief, because understand something, if they have to do so with grief, that is unprofitable for you. Shepherds have a responsibility to tend to infirmity in the flock. And this manifests itself in the greatest way concerning infirmity in the soul. These are they that watch for your souls. Shepherds are always on watch. Look at 1 Peter chapter 5. There is never a time that the shepherd's responsibility is not there. It's always, you know, when I leave work... Thank the Lord with the situation like it is now, I'm not on call anymore. And so I leave work and I don't think about work. It's not like that for the shepherd. The shepherd's always conscious of the sheep. The shepherd's always conscious of that responsibility. There's never a time that the weight of that responsibility is not upon the shepherd. Jesus said, I lay down my life for the sheep. They are his constant focus and concern. The well-being of, of the flock. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse number 2, here it is again, feed the flock of God which is among you. And I want you to see this phrase, taking the oversight thereof. 
Not by constraint, but willingly. Not for filthy lucre, not for dishonest gain, but of a ready mind. Not doing it for what he gets in return, but out of a sincere desire and care for the flock. That phrase, taking the oversight there, is only used in one other place in the New Testament, in Hebrews 12.5, and it's translated, looking diligently. There is a constant looking, a constant carefulness, a constant watchfulness that the shepherd is about concerning the flock that God has placed him over. It is a continual responsibility to tend to infirmity in the flock. They watch for disease. They seek to aid the weak and comfort the feeble. I just noticed I spelled the weak in my notes, W-E-E-K. That's not the kind of weak I'm talking about. Spell checker didn't check that one, um, didn't catch that one. But we're talking about the infirm, those that are without strength. Seek the aid of the weak and comfort the feeble. You know what they are? They are by nature, a faithful shepherd is by nature compassionate. He's by nature compassionate. I want you to see that that's what drove the Lord Jesus to tend to infirmity. L look at Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14. In Matthew chapter 14, and we're only going to read this one verse. I'm not going to multiply scriptures, but I'm going to give you some more if you want to see that this is repeated multiple times in Christ's ministry. In Matthew chapter 14, It says in verse number 14, And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude. And He was moved with what? He was moved with compassion. He had a heart for them. He was moved with compassion. He was filled with sympathy. He was filled with empathy. He was one that uh, in coming in flesh, God became acquainted with our infirmities, right? He took upon Himself the likeness of sinful flesh. And He was in all points tempted, how? Just like we are, yet without sin. He was moved with compassion. He could identify with them. The shepherds of the flock are taken from among the flock. They understand what it's like to be a sheep because they are one themselves, right? And so, he was moved with compassion toward them. And so what did he do? He healed their sick. A faithful shepherd by nature is compassionate. And that drives him to tend to infirmity in the flock. Because he has a desire for their well-being. You're going to find the same thought uh, repeated in Matthew 20 and verse 34. In Mark 1 and verse 41 and Luke 7 and verse number 13. I can repeat those for you later if you want. On Matthew 20, 34, Mark 1, 41, Luke 7, 13, and you see the same pattern that compassion moved the Lord Jesus to heal the sick. So I do want to say this, church. I want you to understand that the shepherds are not alone in this responsibility. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. And, and we're going to see that as we get into the, um, the qualifications, right? The, those qualities that, that the shepherds are supposed to possess. Those qualities there are not unique to the shepherds. Those are qualities that all the church should be striving for. These men should be exemplary in these things. They are setting the example for the flock. Follow me like Paul said as I follow the Lord Jesus, right? Uh, these are qualities to be desired by all. And we see this here uh, with the care for the body of Christ, for the flock. We're all commanded to do good unto all men, especially they that are of the household of faith, right? And 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5 and in verse number 12, And we beseech you, brethren, here we're talking about the pastors, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. Uh, there's three key responsibilities that fall right in line with what we're going to be looking at with the shepherds. They labor among you, they are over you in the Lord, and they admonish you, they teach you, they warn you. And so recognizing these men, I, you ought to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Uh, I heard one pastor say, it doesn't say for their personality's sake. Right? You esteem them very highly in love because they labor in the Word of God to feed the sheep. 
It's for their work's sake that you esteem them very highly. And be at peace among yourselves. And so he, uh, he continues on here in verse number 14. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. It is the responsibility of the entire church, right? It doesn't fall solely on the pastor's shoulders, but certainly the pastors have a heart for this. They tend to infirmity in the flock. They are looking for disease. They are looking uh, for that which will cause issue. They're looking for that weakness. They're looking to come alongside those that are weak and infirm. If you read on in Ezekiel 34, and we won't for time's sake, yeah, we're about out of time. Read 17 through 22 in Ezekiel 34, and you'll see that the Lord's, uh, his, his rebuke there turns from the shepherds to the members of the flock that are fat and that are, and that are pushing, that are using their horns to shove in the side of those that are weak, that they might have the upper hand. So he turns his attention to the flock that are not behaving properly as well. But as we see, the shepherd is a pattern for the flock in these things. And this is a labor-intensive task. What did we read here? This is part of that them that labor among you. This is part of that labor. It's a labor-intensive task that requires constant attention and care. Listen, the shepherd's got to know his flock to care in this way. I was reading, I, I went back as I started on this study and looked at a book that I hadn't looked at in many years. That's, uh, it's a, it's a, a shepherd's take on Psalm 23. I don't even remember the person's name that wrote it, but this guy was literally a shepherd and he's, he's reading through, through Psalm 23 and he's showing how in the natural he's able to identify with these things because of the shepherd's experience. And one of the things when, when he was talking about the use of the rod, one of the things that the shepherd uses the rod for is he'll take the sheep in the corral. And so as the sheep are coming out of the gate into the open field there, he'll stick his rod out to stop that sheep. And each individual sheep, he'll go through there with that rod. He'll look through the wool. I mean, they're big woolly things, you know. It takes some effort to get down in there and kind of see what's going on. And he looks for any kind of disease on the skin, you know, or he feels around there for any kind of infirmity. In other words, he has to have an intimate relationship with each individual sheep. There is constant... Care. There is constant attention there as he examines the flock and, and carefully looks over every sheep, checking for any signs of parasites or disease. Listen, the shepherd can't be aloof and know his sheep that way. The, the shepherd can't be at some, in, in some untouchable distance from the sheep and do this. This is an individual that's involved, that's, that's approachable. And that's what I love about Jesus Christ. I, I've seen the great religious men of our day, and I've literally seen them walking through people with security around them like, don't get close to this religious man. I've seen that at CNN Center downtown. But Jesus Christ was never like that. The multitudes thronged Him. When the disciples said, don't bother him with these little kids, what did he say? Suffer the little children to come to me. He was approachable. He was involved individually in these lives. And so I want to close with Acts chapter 20. I want to show you how Paul was intimately involved with the flock at Act, in Acts chapter 20. Listen to how he described his time among them in Acts chapter Chapter 20. In Acts 20 and in verse number 20, he says, And how I kept back nothing, nothing that was profitable. And his desire, his continual desire and his focus and his emphasis was on the well-being of the sheep. And he said, I didn't keep back anything from you that was profitable for you. And he says, I want you to remember that uh, I have showed you and have taught you. What's the first way that he taught them? Publicly. I stood in the pulpit and I shared the word of God with you, right? I was concerned for your souls in that regard. And I preached faithfully the word of God, not keeping anything back from you. But that wasn't the only way he did it. How else did he teach them? And from house to house. See, the house-to-house -house part shows the level of intimacy that the Apostle Paul had with the Ephesians. He knew them intimately. He preached from the pulpit, but he also taught them house-to-house. -house. I'm not talking... I've seen men that are busybodies in the affairs of, of the sheep's life. That's not what we're talking about here. 
We're not talking about everything goes through the pastor, right? And I'll, I'll clear uh, you, uh, you as far as what's okay and what's not okay. That's not, we're, we're talking about someone that is genuinely concerned and interested and approachable to the sheep and for the sheep. He's interested in their lives. He's available and approachable as Christ was. A shepherd that knows his flock well understands how to minister to them. And so in verse 31, we see Paul's diligence in giving himself to them. Therefore, watch. In his instruction to the shepherds that are there, watch. You've got to look out for these sheep. You've you, you got to be focused upon these sheep, shepherds. You, you can't be over there. You know, like people, how many people do you see on their job today and they're more interested in their phone than they are in their job, right? A faithful shepherd can't be like that. There can't be those type of distractions. Watch. And remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Paul was diligent in giving himself to them, and so a faithful shepherd must be. I thought we would get through two points today. But the Lord told us to stay there. Any thoughts as we close?